Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, as I am each month, I'm joined by Dr. Craig Joseph. He is the Chief Medical Officer at Nordic Consulting Partners and this month's episode of News You Can Use. Craig, thanks for joining me today. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So, uh, unfortunately, we're still talking about COVID because it's still a preeminent topic. It's, I think it's still one of the top trending topics on Twitter has been for as long as I can remember, COVID, uh, that, that hashtag. Um, what's the latest and greatest that you're aware of, especially from a pediatrician's perspective? Well, first of all, I thought COVID was over, um, but now you're reminding me that it's not. So I guess, yeah, we do have to talk about it. I, I think there's some um, exciting news vaccine-wise. Uh, um, the very first um, studies have started to come out, or at least uh, done by the manufacturers, but by Pfizer on children. And so children five to 12 um, in, uh, again, according to Pfizer, not yet peer reviewed, um, children do well tolerate uh, the dose that they've given to them, which I think is half of what the adults get. Um, we're not sure how well the vaccine works because too few children so far have gotten ill from COVID who are in the study. And so um, we know it's safe. Um, we think it's effective, uh, but, but we're not sure yet. So certainly moving in the right direction. Lots of parents are very worried about sending their kids to school um, and, and um, you know, all of the, uh, all of the uh, you know, being around lots of uh, other children um, are appropriately worried and, and really um, wanting a, a vaccine that's safe and effective to come out so that they can, they can vaccinate their, their kids. Uh, so I think that's also, that's big news. Right. But also parents are worried about giving their children a vaccine that, you know, is safe. I mean, we have decent data for, you know, the vaccine schedule and uh, it's it's been developed over time and continued to be refined. This is a newish vaccine. Um, they're trying to balance those aspects, but uh, you know, based on the data that we've seen, and you're right, it's it's not peer reviewed. It's as somebody put it, it's I, I want to see more than the PR from uh, those companies before I really sort of uh, pass opinion, which you know is the appropriate level of science. But the data that has been shared and published suggests that it is a safe vaccine, and as you rightly say we're not sure about the effectiveness, but based on the effectiveness in adults, it's probably going to be effective. Absolutely. There's, and, and, and you know, with regard to, you know, safety, um, yeah, these are uh, new, new vaccines. Um, they're there and there's no two ways around that. And so, you know, really you have to look at the risk of, um, of a, of a new vaccine that, you know, will be stuck before it's approved. We'll, we'll have the numbers in. We don't have them today. It's not approved today. Um, so we, we will have those numbers in, but again, you need to compare it to the risk of not vaccinating. And, um, you know, we're not in a, uh, um, um, we're not in a, in a controlled environment in, in life. There are, there are other risks and there's, so there's risks of, of taking a vaccine and there's risks of, of not taking a vaccine. And uh, I think both have to be weighed. And, and, and so um, I think, unfortunately, we're not in a position during a global pandemic um, to wait uh, a couple of decades on the science, to be sure. Um, lots of people, though, I think, have decided that they're going to do that. Um, it's not turning out well for them, statistically speaking. And so, you know, we know 90 to 95 percent of, of folks dying in the hospital with COVID today are, are unvaccinated. And so um, the risk for children is, is, is uh, smaller, we think, from, from COVID, um, uh, but the risk is real. And uh, there are uh, disease processes that are associated with COVID that uh, cause uh, death in, in perfectly uh, previously healthy children. So um, 
I get it, and and there's a, a reason to be cautious. And um, none of these have been approved yet in the, in the United States uh, for kids. But it, it seems like the writing's on the wall, and that that's what we're heading to. Unless we see something that's uh, surprising or shocking in the data, it's really just how much data do we need to convince the federal regulatory folks and then the um, the medical profession that the vaccines are uh, safe. Um, and effective. Again, safety seems to be um, coming out already, uh, but uh, efficacy is, is the thing that we'll need to see. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I continue to reflect back on, and I, I'm, I'm going to give the credit to the individual that I believe first gave this to me, is the analogy with seatbelts, um, and that would be you. Uh, and I, I think a great analogy. Uh, we, we wear seatbelts, but they don't absolutely prevent you from dying in a car accident, but they really, really help and we, we you know, advocate for them. Here's what's interesting about that relative to this balance and safety and uh, you know, getting this risk reward essentially for parents. Um, I saw some interesting data that said that the whole pushback on seatbelts when they were first introduced was identical. <laughs> yes, yes, I read that. And, and um, I think it was a 60 Minutes interview, I think, uh, or a uh, piece that, that I, I saw from, <laughs> from the 70s, where people are like, well, I don't, um, I don't need the government interfering um, in, in, my, uh, in my affairs. And I don't like the seatbelt because I find it too restrictive. And it's not safe because if you get into a car accident, the seatbelt can jam. And then you're trying to get out of a fiery car crash and you can't because you're, you're locked in because of the seatbelt jammed. Um, and and uh, yeah, nowadays, none of those, you know, we don't, we don't talk about it um, because it's, it's been proven to, to be uh, helpful uh, under almost every circumstance, the seatbelt, and there was no airbags back then. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I wrote a, a blog piece uh, last night um, based on a, an article in um, an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association by an infectious disease doctor who said, hey, um, uh, this is not new, this pandemic, um, remember AIDS. And I was intrigued because well, I, I do remember AIDS, um, but I, I don't remember um, people refusing to get medication that was um, you know, proven to be life-saving, but it absolutely happened. It absolutely happened. So that when uh, oral um, antiretroviral meds came out and we finally learned in the mid nineties, the, the magic combination of medications that could take someone who was dying of AIDS and uh, almost miraculously bring them back to um, their previous uh, state of health, um, many, many people refused to take the medications and died, unnecessarily died, um, because they didn't trust the uh, doctors that were telling them to, that the, the meds were safe and, and effective, and for uh, various other reasons as well. But, you know, going through some of the things that people said, it's the exact same thing that people are concerned about and saying about vaccinations today and about, um, um, you know, COVID. Um, I don't think anyone uh, with AIDS was questioning whether it really existed, um, but I, they were absolutely questioning that the medications were safe and effective. And um, uh, a significant number of people uh, died of AIDS uh, because they wouldn't take the meds. And, and um, seems, it seems, you know, the parallels are, are scary uh, to seatbelts and to, you know, other, pan, other epidemics. Right, and, and previous pandemics, in fact, going back to 1918, I read that, uh, the, uh, um, the book on that that was published before this most recent pandemic, and uh, the similarities are, um, I guess, something of a struggle, because despite knowing the history, history is set to repeat itself, or is repeating itself, with some of these resistance uh, positions that don't seem to innovate. And the, the thing that I find most troubling in all of this is that we have new tools that make the dis and misinformation campaign so much more effective. The megaphone given to individuals um, that used to be on a, the back of a car running around uh, the Wild West selling their latest snake oil is now far more effective um, and very targeted. I think that's one of the things. I recent piece on 
uh, one of the big players in social media that they've known this and, you know, have been playing to it for an extended period of time. In fact, um, uh, uh, as far as they're concerned, that's just uh, uh, table stakes for having solutions that allow people to share information uh, with no controls. And, you know, I'm all about freedom of information, but what happens when that information damages people, which it's doing at the moment? Um, yeah, well, certainly uh, social media and big tech have some some uh, answering to do um, with respect to their uh, their um, effects on on uh, on the population in general. We we don't need to even you know talk about uh, health and science. There are lots of other areas um, where it's it's we're going to look back and say how did we ever let this happen? Um, how did we ever let um, uh, you know, experienced um, uh, professionals uh, get on the same level as someone who um, just uh, uh, are, are making things up. And, and we're, you know, that's the problem, I think, with social media and sometimes with um, regular media, yeah, equating uh, people with no experience and, and no uh, uh, true understanding of what they're talking about to be able to, um, you know, be on the same level as those that do. And so, uh, again, an another problem with society, I think, is this lack of um, believing in experts or expertise. Um, but that's that's a, a whole different topic. Um, I, yeah, we're I, not going to be able to dive into, into that. But I, I will, uh, in, in uh, the blog post, I'll post something from George Takai that uh, I thought absolutely uh, captured the conspiracy theory defined as essentially a belief uh, of the world's scientific experts who miss something that they've spent their life researching um, that you were able to uncover in uh, three minutes of Googling and uh, got to the appropriate piece of information. Um, I, yeah. I, I just, I struggle with where we've gotten to, but... We, we call that doing your research, Dr. <laughs> doing your research, three minutes on Google. That's the, that's it. If only that were the case uh, when, <laughs> when we were originally doing research, it would have been a whole lot faster. But uh, uh, <laughs> um, So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today I'm talking to uh, Dr. Craig Joseph. He's the chief medical officer at Nordic. We're uh, doing our news you can use. Uh, we were talking about COVID-19 and uh, the, uh, the, the uh uh, improvement on access of vaccines to the five to 12. So uh, uh, some potential for opening up access to uh, school age children, which is, you know, obviously another pool that has been uh, not available, um, not available today, but it will be um, a little bit more on boosters. Uh, so I think there's lots of confusion on boosters, right? Um, I, I, I know I'm confused. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, there's. I think one of the things um, in the in the pediatric literature that we're really focusing on is the difference between a third dose and a booster dose. And, mm. and uh, it sounds like we're we're splitting hairs here, but they are they are different. So for immunocompromised folks today, uh, assuming that they've gotten one of the mRNA vaccines, um, uh, we're, we're, the recommendation is if you're immunocompromised, if your if your immune system is not working well, that you get a third dose. They're not calling it a booster because a booster implies that that um, the first two doses work great and uh, slowly your your immunity is waning and going down over time and you need a, a, a quick boost to get you back up um, as opposed to a third dose. So um, with the idea that, well, if you're immunocompromised, you actually never really acquired excellent uh, protection and um, you're getting a third dose, which is what you're what you need to get up to that to that level, as opposed to a booster where you were at that level we, that you needed to be in, and now you're not there anymore. Be that as it may, um, there are lots of questions though about boosters for uh, adults um, and and who needs one, if anyone, and uh, when do they need it? And so as you as you allude, uh, Pfizer uh, came out months ago saying that they their data showed that uh, people do need boosters and um, the FDA uh, is contemplating and the CDC is contemplating um, those data and uh, trying to make a determination. One of the advisory groups that rec makes recommendations to the FDA um, 
thought that there is no indication right now for a booster for, for most of us. Um, they did recommend it for, for patients over 65. And again, for anyone with uh, an, immune, uh, an immune problem, be that, be, call it a booster or a third dose, whatever you want to call it. So we're, we're not sure where, where we're going to go. Um, is the FDA going to accept that recommendation? They typically, but don't always. Um, it, it'll, it'll be interesting. Um, I read an article today that uh, CVS is hoping to hire something like uh, 7,500 people in one day uh, to boost their, their numbers because they're afraid they're going to get underwater um, if slash when uh, more COVID doses are, are recommended. Um, plus, there's concern that the flu season is going to be bad this year because uh, virtually no one got flu last year. And so uh, there's going to be a big need for flu vaccination. There is right now a big need for flu vaccination as well. You know, I, so it's interesting you bring up CVS. I think the other area of uh, sort of exploration and uh, discussion is, uh, you know, the impact of these other companies. And one of the things that strikes me about that is that, you know, CVS is concerned about being overwhelmed because, they're right there. They're at the coal face where people are. Um, and as a result, end up being on the front line for uh, just, you know, a lot of access to healthcare resources, um, medications, in this case, vaccinations. Um, but we've seen a number of these organizations sort of dip in and dip out. I posted something about this, you know, Google. Uh, decided to its, uh, dismantle its health division. And, you know, for me, that was round two because we had uh, the previous one where they created the database, uh, you know, your health record. I forget what it was called. I don't think it was Health Vault because that was Microsoft's. Um, they stepped away from that. They came back in. Um, I sort of said, well, you know, healthcare is hard. Even these folks can't get it right, even with some incredible talent that they pulled in. Well, not, not, not right. Um, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, well, you know, first of all, just kind of talking a second about CVS and, and, and Walgreens. If, if five years ago you'd have told me that um, people would be lining up to get, you know, flu shots and, and other vaccines from the, the corner drugstore, I, I would have thought you were crazy five years ago. Really? Why? I, I would have. Because why would I go and get my flu shot at the, at the corner a drugstore, I, I would go to my doctor's office. I mean, that's just typically, I, I think it was five years ago, maybe it was a little bit more, but um, uh, you know, as you say, the, the corner drugstores have become a nexus of, of healthcare delivery when uh, up until very, very recently, they were just a place you picked up prescriptions and some over-the-counter, uh, you know, uh, ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Um, so that transformation has, has been amazing. Um, you know, with respect to some of the tech companies, yeah, healthcare is hard, and I'm not sure that they couldn't um, make it better. But I think they figured out that the amount of time and money uh, uh, that it would take to make healthcare better, at least in the United States, um, it, it did, there wasn't a good business case there. Uh, our system is is pretty entrenched and um, um, takes a takes a lot to to move even a, a little bit. And, when you're used to making changes that affect the world in, in uh, days to uh, weeks to months, it's the idea of thinking about decades. I think is uh, um, doesn't doesn't appeal. Um, but I mean, has, as Aaron Martin said, they haven't really gotten out. That's just a pullback of um, the uh, you know that division. They've got all these other divisions. They're still uh, they're fully poking. Good. Or Fitbit for a wearable. They've got, uh, you know, uh, medical devices. Hey, uh, you know, the, uh, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has said that uh, the, his, the legacy of uh, his company will be in healthcare. Um, that's what he has, yeah. he has predicted. So far, not so much. Um, oh, but, I, that's yeah. not true. That's not true. If you watch the Apple event, it was full of radiology images. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. I'm not going to deny that. And I do, I, I love the company. I just don't think that, um, you know, if they've changed healthcare. Uh, no, they're they, full of intent. Is, is, I, is I think that's great. And they might be proven to be right. I, we just, we certainly haven't seen it yet. Um, no. 
you know, but there are, there are companies that are kind of combining technology and their location to, to work in different ways. Um, you know, uh, we were talking about uh, Dollar General, I think, you know, right. either previously. Um, you know, this is, a, again, <laughs> if you would have told me uh, even a few years ago that we'd be talking about Dollar General as a, uh, a provider of healthcare services, um, an innovative provider of healthcare services, I would have thought you were you were uh, not fully there. Uh, but that seems to be where they're going. They've hired a chief medical officer, right. uh, their first, and um, they've pointed out a few things that, hey, uh, we are in, the, uh, in, in rural areas where others are not. Um, people know what they're, you know, they, they, they know us and, and um, um, trust us to some extent. Um, they, they noted a term that I've never heard of before that uh, many of their stores are in pharmacy deserts. I've heard of food deserts where you can't get healthy right. food, healthy fresh food, but um, they're noting that hey, people have trouble getting um, uh, to pharmacies uh, where where a lot of their stores are, and um, they're exploring you know how they can help. Can they um, uh, take a, a, a put a few uh, telehealth kiosks in the back of their store, connected either to their own doctors or to uh, an, another network of doctors, and then can they facilitate uh, prescriptions? Uh, for those uh, folks, again, how does that work? I don't know. Maybe is that regional pharmacies? Do they overnight medications to people? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but they're, it sounds like they're exploring it. And um, it's it's fascinating to me to kind of meet people where they are, to leverage both your technology and your your physical you know, brick and mortar stores. Um, that, that seems to be the sweet spot. It's not all technology. It's not all location and brick and mortar. No, it, it really isn't. And, and- what I remember from years back when we were working on a telehealth model and, uh, you know, one of the stats that was really surprising to me was that more people as a percentage of the population live within five minutes. It could have been five miles. I know it was a, a reasonably close distance, although you had to have a car. So let's call it 15 minutes by car um, to a, uh, a pharmacy of one or another. Now, there is a percentage that fall into the group that are not, and we still have to sort of address that. But that opportunity for me is extraordinarily exciting. I mean, I was impressed with the Dollar General hire. I thought the individual was, you know, wow, what a great resource to bring in. And the other thing about trust, and, you know, you were talking about this and why would Dollar General, but I interviewed somebody, um, Andrew Suggs, who, is essentially a barber shop that he has morphed into a resource for healthcare. He's actually in um, the latest cohort for Health Innovation Hub at um, uh, one of the innovations, I forget which one. But I was super impressed. I mean, that for me was, as you point out, meeting them at the space or area that people are. And part of me thinks he should partner with Dollar General and start to set up that because people come to those kind of services, not just to have the telehealth or the pharmacy, but bring people in and create that trusting network because we've lost a lot of the trust with the existing systems um, and we've disconnected a lot of people who don't have access. I, I, I agree. It's really meeting, meeting folks where they are and not where we want them to be or where it's convenient for us. It's, again, as physicians, uh, we're used to people coming to us at our, at our at, you know, putting the health system ar- ar- around us at our, our convenience so that, um, you know, we, we can maximize our efficiency. And um, those days are seemingly over. Uh, as sad as it is uh, to say for a physician, um, the world is not revolving around us anymore. And, um, you know, the, the faster we get on board with that, I think the, the better off we are. Well, I, 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 um, yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit and say it's not that the world revolves around the physician. I mean, I think, you know, it revolves around the patient. We sort of remain a central resource but I think the, the change or the move is that it can't be in these, uh, you know, fancy buildings. Those remain the sort of sub uh, activity. We, we focus too much energy on healthcare, which is actually sick care. That's where all that, you know, high level, high intensity activity goes on. 
And the vast benefit, one of the reasons that we've seen better results against this pandemic in some countries in Africa, for instance, is they have a fantastic public health, community-based, community-facing interaction in the community. And we, may, we need more of that in this country. And some of these companies, Dollar General, Walmarts of, of this world, I think are at least closer to that community that I think will help to start deliver that. I think it's, you know, this is all good news from my perspective. Uh, maybe some physicians see it as bad news, but um, I, I, I think this is great opportunity. Unfortunately, as usual, we have run out of time. Um, it just remains for me to uh, thank you as usual, Craig, for a fantastic conversation um, and uh, look forward to the next time. I'll, I'll be there. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. <laughs>